Hello, welcome to the New Stack Makers, a podcast where we talk about at scale application development, deployment, and management. CloudBase Jenkins X has a new UI made for the demands of continuous development. Learn more about CloudBees, Jenkins X, and the CloudBees leadership in CICD at cloudbees.com. It's another sunny day in Vegas, isn't it, Elliot? It's freezing. Freezing. It's like raining. Here with Elliot Horowitz, CTO and co-founder of MongoDB. And we're in a parking lot in downtown Las Vegas, which they've converted into a really almost like it feels in some respects like an art space, kind of a maker kind of focus. But it's the uh, work of IF, it's the work of Packet. And they are conducting their conference here called IFX. And Elliot came over from the reInvent show, which is happening now. And so, Elliot, thank you for joining. Uh, no problem. Thanks for having me. So, MongoDB has been around for how many years now? I've lost track. So, we first launched a little over a decade ago. So, in the spring of 2000, uh, 2009. What kind of databases were you using before MongoDB? When you were at the... Uh, yeah. Like the company that you sold in 2000. Shop Wiki. Yeah. So there was all MySQL, mm-hmm. a little bit of you know, Berkeley DB. We were doing some hacking around there. Uh, prior to that, I was at DoubleClick, and it was a combination of a lot of Oracle, uh, some MySQL. So mostly, you know, traditional relational databases, which is pretty much the only thing that really existed at that time anyway. When did it start to drive you crazy when all the data started coming just from every source whatsoever? What were some of the things you remember uh, almost immediately and so you know we had so if you look at shop wiki for example we ended up building uh, half a dozen custom databases just for that in a matter of two years you know we were collecting massive amounts of information on the internet crawling the internet and when you're writing a web crawler one of the things you have to do is crawl a web page extract all the links on the page and see if you've been there before and track them so every time you download a web page, you end up getting like 50 to 60 links. So we had a database with trillions of URLs on them and storing that in anything off the shelf was virtually impossible. And so we built a you know highly customized database just for storing URLs. We did the same thing for images, same things for crawling data. Uh, we were storing a product catalog that had over 500 million products. And products, you know, every product may only have 30 to 50 attributes. But across all products, there's you know thirty thousand possible types of attributes. So trying to figure out how to store that efficiently in a relational database is very challenging. So we had a huge amounts of problems just storing data, searching data, querying data, understanding what to do with it, scaling it, keeping it up, uh, backing it up. Everything was just incredibly hard. And you must have had friends in the business who were having the same. And everyone everywhere is the same problem. The so double click, you know, serving billions of ads. Uh, a day around the world, trying to do it in a low latency anywhere on the planet and being synchronous, uh, super challenging. And everywhere we went, people were having problems with databases, working around databases. You know, every time you see a caching layer put in front of a database, it's probably because the database isn't doing what it really should be doing. And at the, especially at that time, you know, the standard was, oh, put a relational database and then have a cache in front of it. Like the whole industries were created just to solve that problem, which is really a, a band-aid on the real problem. So is that term NoSQL almost a liberating way of thinking about databases for you? So it was really never about SQL. So the term NoSQL kind of just happened. It wasn't ours. It was it happened at some random meetup in San Francisco, totally by accident. Uh, and so SQL, you know, SQL is great, but we don't use it that much, obviously. But the challenge really for us is really about the data model and being distributed by nature. Right, so my problem is fundamentally with tabular databases, right? Being confined to you know rows and columns, uh, and being not being able to store sort of richly structured data inside of a table or a collection. Uh, and then once you do that, you need a query language that understands documents natively. And so SQL just doesn't make sense anymore. Because SQL is so designed to be you know for tabular data, you need a query language that can handle non-tabular data, can handle arrays, can handle hierarchy 
can handle these things in a very intuitive way. And we also took some really interesting learnings from things like you know the Unix pipeline, where instead of having to create sort of weird big SQL queries, you just create lots of little programs, combine them together, and turn that into analytics, uh, which is a very simple, easy way to debug and build complex queries. So those were some major challenges then at the time. So how did you start thinking about it as a product? What, what, what were some of those realizations when you realized, well, my problems are not just my problems, they're a lot of people's problems? So when we first started working on MongoDB, we actually were thinking about, we had an application idea we wanted to build, and we're like, all right, we're gonna go build this application. And we very quickly realized that the database was gonna be a huge challenge for us. So we started designing the database that we would need for our application. And after only a few weeks, we realized we were more interested in the database than the actual application we were gonna build. Talked to a couple of friends, they were like, yeah, if you built that, I'd probably use it. And uh, went from there. And then yeah. we said, let's just go build it, see what happens. What did you build behind it initially that stands today? In terms of the, the core feature set? Yeah. I mean, frankly, a lot of the core features from the first year or two are, are still there. I mean, they've probably been rewritten almost entirely just from a code standpoint. But the core data model, the core query language, the core way you do indexing, the semantics there, are all pretty much exactly the same as it was back then. Mm. Now, you think about the problems that you have, and you did a lot of the hard work in building MongoDB, so users wouldn't have those issues that you faced before you started, you know, before exactly. you built the technology. So they don't even know necessarily that pain to some extent, because that was another time. Yeah, I mean, the junior developers who haven't been around for that long, absolutely, they, they've they never experienced that kind of world. And so many relational databases are trying to mimic some of our features, so uh, even more so, that's very much true these days. So today, what are the pains that they talk about that, that would, that they'll talk about in five years or 10 years to junior developers that potentially won't have those issues either. What, what are those problems that they're talking about today that really kind of vex them and, and challenge your thinking as well? So a lot of the things that we think about are, you know, so as, as good as any database can possibly be, there's always more things that people want to do with data. Uh, you know, the interesting thing that's happening these days is you can, you know, hard drives are so cheap and there are such cheap ways to store data. There's really no need to ever delete anything ever. And people want to store data and learn from it, make it interactive, learn from it, let their users interact with their data. And that just creates you know, ever more problems. So how do you take advantage of lower cost storage? How do you take advantage of S3 as a way to tier data uh, effectively and easily? And we're working on things in that space. How do you bring more features you know, into the fold and sort of go from just a database and a set of components to more of a platform that you say, okay, here's my data. You figure out what pieces to use. You figure out how to organize it. You figure out how to tier and manage it. Here's what I need to do for my business, for my use case. I don't want to think about. I don't want to think about this. Just make it work. Just make it work. But then the, but the balloon has to squeeze somewhere. There has to be some air that that moves to another space, doesn't it? Like that's the analogy that Agent Cockroach would use. It's like yeah, you can have a balloon, right? But as soon as you squeeze it, you know, you know that you're going to blow it up in some other part of the balloon, right? Which means the complexity. You can like squeeze complexity out of something, but then yep. it goes elsewhere. Right? Yeah, well, that's uh, frankly what's been happening with the database space for the last 10 years. But if you think about application developers, the goal of application developers these days is to treat everything besides the database as stateless. So if you think, go back 20 years, right, a standard application was gonna have you know some Java web servers maybe, and those web servers would actually keep some state. You would do things in your load balancer to keep you know users hitting the same web server so you can do in-memory caching, things of that nature. And that sort of stuff is completely gone now, right? Basically, anything that's not the database is thought to be stateless. And sort of a Kubernetes container world, app servers should be stateless. You want to even move towards things like you know functions as a service or Lambda, which are truly stateless. And you just spin them up, automatically scale them, tear them down. I don't care what happens to them. And so the only place you store state is the database. So now the database gets more and more complicated and the data platform has to get more and more complicated to be able to handle these, this complexity. So is that a good reason why you are moving in the direction of becoming more of a data platform yourself? Exactly. So for us, it's important that we, you know, so once we have a, you know, we have a great database, people love the database, but if we don't solve other problems, if we don't help you bring that data to other use cases and do more things with it, it ends up just being a 
different kind of a pain. You end up having to take this massive data set, because now it's not only just the same data you've always had, it's a huge data set, and especially with Mongo, you can store you know, enormous data sets. Now I gotta put it somewhere else and do something with that. Well, that's hard, that's complicated. Even backing up really big data sets, and if you've got, you know, backing up a 100 gig data set, that's pretty easy, anyone can do that. If you wanna back up a 100 terabyte data set or a two petabyte data set, that's hard, it's challenging. Um, and so that's sort of the kinds of things we want to solve. Same as putting data onto you know things like S3, but still have, being able to query across it, letting you effectively use you know much cheaper storage, letting you bring text search directly into the database, so you don't have to think about synchronization and solving those kinds of problems. Um, and even doing things like automatically synchronizing data between your you know major uh, database in the back end with phones. Right. A lot of developers these days really care about mobile first experiences and having really great mobile experiences. And a huge portion of that is bringing data in real time directly to devices. So that as changes happen on the phone or in the back end or on someone else's device, synchronization happens. And it happens if you're online or offline. Uh, and if you're offline, when you come back online, things just automatically synchronize once again. And so we're doing a lot of work with that with Realm and building sort of a really great synchronization solution there. Yeah, I was gonna ask about Realm. And for for people who may not be familiar with Realm, you acquired it, uh, when did you acquire it, in May? So we acquired Realm in May. Yeah. Uh, Realm is a very popular database for mobile devices. And it's popular because it's based on a lot of the same theories that MongoDB is based on, right? It's object-based as opposed to tabular. Uh, it has transactions. It's very much designed for a mobile environment. So if you've got mobile code, you can have objects that live in the in the database that UI elements respond to in real time as the as the documents change. Um, so this is very much in tune with the way developers on mobile have to interact with the concurrency models with the threading models. So it just fits their worldview very nicely. And our goal now is to take that mobile database, automatically synchronize that back to Mongo, and not the whole database, but built on top of a set of declarative rules. So you can say, all right, I've got this big database in the back end. Now I want to synchronize Elliot's data or the data that Elliot's allowed to view or modify, bring that directly to the phone in real time. So a mobile developer just interacts directly with the data on the phone. They don't have to think about how do I write it back? Do I have to go through REST APIs? What's local? What's cached? What's not cached? They just use the database and the back end just takes care of synchronizing it, making sure it's persisted, making sure it's backed up, handling conflicts and all those sorts of things. So what's the technology architecture on the back end then that you're developing? What is it that, what is that complexity that you're managing now? What, you know, how have you built it? So it's all obviously built on top of Mongo and we're building, we've got a platform called Stitch that has a set of primitive rules and functions. So that's the baseline. The base there is, and these rules let you d determine who can see what data, who can modify what data, and it's a pretty, at a pretty granular level. So you can have a document that has a list of owners, and those owners can do anything to the document. You can have an array of people who are allowed to view it but not modify it, and it can be as granular as people really want. And then so we start with that as the base, and then the key part is how do we then synchronize that data and handle conflicts? Um, and some of the challenging parts are, for example, in the mobile world, you're not having you know thousands of clients. You could have you know a million a million versions of the application out there. You may have old versions of the applications in different, you know, different states. And so you've really got to be able to handle a wide number of clients, a variety of clients, cross-platform, all, you know, how do you handle if the phone's been offline for three hours and it comes back online, there's an enormous amount of data you've got to resynchronize. Uh, so lots of interesting challenges in that space. And you're in Stitch is a serverless architecture? What is Stitch? So Stitch is completely serverless. It's a serverless sort of development framework. And what it does is it puts a layer on top of MongoDB that does a number of things. So for example, it has triggers in it. So if you have data in MongoDB and it has data in MongoDB changes, if you insert data, delete data, update data, you can have a trigger fire that sort of does whatever you want. It just executes a serverless JavaScript function that can go put something onto a Kafka queue, send an email, send a text message, it doesn't really matter. It just goes and does sort of whatever you need it to do. Uh, and the key is that you know for a lot of applications, real time is absolutely critical and this just makes it easier. It also does things, um, it's got sort of static hosting and web development modes in it, so you can sort of build single page applications very easily. And it also has a generic functions system. So if you want to do serverless functions that are either based real time or based on user demands, you can do that as well. So with, with Stitch then as a serverless architecture on the back end. What are you, you what are you using for that serverless architecture? Are you using 
Lambda or what are you doing? So that's all that's all our own. It's all your own. It's all our own. It's all just built in Go and okay. we've got a team uh, developing it. Uh, but it's completely serverless. Why'd you choose Go? Why'd we choose Go? That's a good question. Uh, I think it really comes down to for this use case, we wanted something very performant, right? So we need something very fast. We're handling, you know, huge volumes of connections and huge numbers of requests. We need something very performant. We wanted something that was sort of as you know, let our developers work as fast as possible. Uh, and so it's a pretty good language for that. And the concurrency in Go is particularly good for handling sort of very large numbers of connected clients. And with Stitch, where we have sort of you know web applications directly connected, we need to handle very large numbers of connections, and that works pretty well for that also. So, okay, okay, great. Um, I want to shift the conversation a little bit. I know you had an announcement earlier this week, and you have added a lot of new features to MongoDB Atlas. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about Atlas and what it is and what these new security features are that you've added. Yeah, so MongoDB Atlas is our managed database for MongoDB. Uh, and so for most of our users, you know, the vast majority of just people using MongoDB are probably running in the public cloud. That's where most new development's happening these days. And MongoDB Atlas runs on all three major public clouds, you know, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. And it lets you just use MongoDB through an API through the UI without having to worry about anything. And it's very simple. So you can go and put a credit card in and start with a free tier that costs nothing, all the way up to very large started clusters uh, with pretty interesting features like global clusters that span the world, both read only and read write, where you can put different data and different geographies all in one cluster. And it's all fully managed. So you don't have to think about servers going down, things breaking. We handle all of that. We handle monitoring, backup, all those sorts of all, all those sorts of features. And so obviously in a, in a hosted database world, security is incredibly important. So we've got a lot of sort of really fancy security features, a lot of certifications, um, and we just announced a number of uh, interesting integrations with Amazon, especially around some security features. I think the biggest one is integration with Private Link. Uh, Private Link is Amazon's way of connecting, you know, a securely a customer's sort of VPC, their network, with a, a third-party service. And so now you can use Private Link to connect your Amazon services, whether it's running an EC2 and an app server in EC2 or Lambda, to MongoDB Atlas in the most possibly secure way. So you also now offer SAML authentication as well? Yep, so Atlas now has a single sign-on, so you can connect MongoDB Atlas with your SAML system. So if you have corporate single, corporate single sign-on, you can do that. And we'll be doing more of those things over the coming months as well. And there's also the, and you also are integrating more deeply with Amazon EventBridge and AWS CloudFormation. How's that being done? So CloudFormation is uh, one of the things we're working on in a suite of things that are all about how you, get, uh, how you can control Atlas. So about two months ago, we announced integrations with Terraform and uh, Kubernetes through the Open Service Broker API. Uh, and so CloudFormation is very similar. Right, no matter how important the database is to your application, it's never your entire application. And developers want a single configuration to deploy the entire application. So it's like, okay, here's a file. This is what my application is. Here are all the components that it needs. Here's everything together. And now with cloud, now that, that CloudFormation supports Atlas, you can define your entire application architecture in CloudFormation, deploy it, and it will go and call the Atlas APIs, make that all happen, uh, and that's pretty simple. It's getting quite complicated then to manage all this infrastructure, I imagine. I mean, you're adding so many different services. So what are you doing internally to help kind of simplify your own chaos, so to speak? What are some of the lessons learned that you're coming out of all this work? Because you're, you're doing a lot. Hire a lot of very smart people. Yeah. Um, you know, we do, a, we do a lot. I think one of the key things that we do is we have a really good engineering process. Um, that scale, you know, we keep having to evolve it as we scale, but the, one of the key theories behind it has always been pushing down decisions and knowledge as far down as we possibly can. Uh, so we've got a process where we go through scope review and spec review, and we have individual contributors writing these things and involved in them from day zero. So they're not handed a thing that they don't really understand why and what it's for. And so every engineer knows why, you know, why they're why what they're working on is important, how end users are thinking about it, what actually matters. And it allows engineers just to make better decisions, move faster, distribute knowledge more. And they don't they're not acting just as like, you know, programming monkeys. They're actually, you know, people doing 
things that matter or that they care about that they get to see what actually matters at the end of the day. How does it work on your teams then, like on the engineering teams? You know, how does that affect the, the makeup and organization of your teams and, and then the workflows and processes and technologies that you adopt? So we, uh, we have abused JIRA to a pretty high degree to make our work, <laughs> to make our work for our workflows. But you know, we've got a few things that we do that are a little bit different. One is we really don't have managers in engineering who aren't technical. So every manager is involved in technical decisions, is, you know, stays close to the code, stays close to customers, almost more importantly, and is involved in customer decisions and working with customers, helping out on support. Uh, and because we have, you know, because all the managers are actually doing real work as well, we do have a, a big investment in program management. I think that's one of the things that we do a lot of as a way to sort of augment uh, the managers to help things moving slowly and so you know engineers don't get stuck or to make sure there's no bottlenecks to make sure everyone is working on things that matter and not getting stuck in meetings that don't matter uh, and we also have a a pretty good meeting culture where meetings are meant to be useful and if they're not useful um, they stop um, and one of the my favorite ones though is the engineering process that i was talking about before was a scope and a spec process it's all it's all written and it allows people to mostly resolve things asynchronously. So every week there may be 10 to 20 different documents that need to get reviewed and approved. And almost 95% of them get approved before the meeting starts. People have discussions and comments on Google Docs. They have, you know, they can debate them, they can go have a sidebar, they can go, you know, put the notes back on the document. It allows people who don't think in, on, you know, as quickly on their feet in a meeting to get all, you know, everything out that they need to say. Uh, it, it makes sure that the loudest person doesn't win, that the best decisions win, not whoever can argue the best in a 30 minute meeting. Uh, and it's just very efficient, especially as we scale, especially as the MongoDB engineering team is more and more global, spread around the world. Uh, it just makes, it makes life very smooth. Now you have, uh, great. Now you have offered uh, this new full text search capability. Are your developers using that? Uh, so the new full-text search capability in Atlas, or it's based on Lucene, uh, we are using it internally for some things. We're going to be moving some more of our things over to it as well. Um, it's pretty fun. It works. We have obviously have a lot of data in Mongo internally. And so, yeah, so we are using it internally also. And tell us a little bit about it you know, and why you developed yeah. it. So, you know, for a lot of our users are using MongoDB for their core transactional database, for using it as sort of their core system of record, but they also need text search. For some applications, it's text search is you know, super important. And for some, it's just you know that search box that lives in that upper right corner that's just like a, hey, I need it there in case someone needs to search something. Right. And so t before this, people had to go and figure out how to synchronize their data from MongoDB to something else. And all of these something else else's really are basically based on Lucene. Right, Lucene is sort of a really great search engine. It's by far the best thing out there. And so what we did is we embedded Lucene directly in MongoDB Atlas, handle all of that yourself, and now you have one connection string. So now through MongoDB, you query MongoDB, and if you do happen to do a text search, it can go and query Lucene for you. But you don't have to worry about monitoring it or backing up or managing it. Everything's just taken care of for you inside of Atlas. Getting to the end of the interview, but I also wanted to ask about the data lake capability that you're offering. It seems like there's some corollary to the text search in terms of being able to query S3. Yeah, so I think the corollary is is one language and one driver that people can use to query different types of data in different places. So the use case is very different, but the key for me is that there's you know not a not a new learning curve for a new query language, and new drivers, new tools, same tools, same query language, same everything. But the purpose of data lake is pretty different, right? And data lake is kind of uh, an interesting product that solves a problem that a lot of people have, where they have this enormous amount of data. They tend to want to store this enormous amount of data on S3, because it's just the most cost-effective way to store this data. Now they store it in lots of different formats. And so what data lake does, it lets you query this data that's on S3, so it can live in your S3 bucket. So you've got an S3 bucket, it's got a bunch of data in it. Could be in CSV files or JSON files or Avro files or Parquet files, doesn't really matter to us. And then you can just run a Mongo query against that data without doing anything. You, there's a configuration file where you map the, the paths and the fi you know, struct files in your buckets to collections with a bunch of sort of nice ways to do that pretty quickly. And then you just run regular Mongo queries. And so in a matter of seconds, you can go from having raw data on S3 to running queries. Uh, and that's pretty powerful. 
and it will scale because it's all serverless. It all just, we spin up as many sort of compute nodes as we need to. So you don't have to think about it. You just pay for the compute. And it's just completely dynamic. Hmm. Interesting times. And so 2020 is just on just uh, a month or so away. And I'm curious on what you're thinking for the next year. What are some of your goals and how you think you'll be extending your own platform? Yeah, so a lot of the goals for us over the next year, you know, we've got a lot of new things. We've got Realm, we've got Tech Search, we've got Data Lake, we've got MongoDB Charts. And it's really about turning sort of these set of tools into a really nicely integrated platform. So if you want to use anyone individually, you can, it's totally fine. But if you want to use them all together really powerfully, bundling them together in a really nice way. So again, you can just put your data in the system and we'll help you figure out where to put it, what tools to use. So you can just like, again, have data, query it, get benefits from it, serve it to your users, all without having to jump through tons of different hoops and have it just work for you as opposed to against you. Thank you very much for your time, Elliot. No, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been really interesting talking with you about how you really faced challenges in your early, early career around databases and the complexities that came then and how the complexities are changing now and why that does mean a data platform makes sense for MongoDB and its users and these new features that sets you're adding and how that's going to change again how people think about you know how they interact with their own data so thank you for your time no problem great thanks a lot yeah listen to more episodes of the new stack makers at the newstack.io slash podcast please rate and review us on itunes like us on youtube and follow us on soundcloud thanks for listening and see you next time Cloudbase Jenkins X has a new UI made for the demands of continuous development. Learn more about Cloudbase Jenkins X and the Cloudbase leadership in the CICD at cloudbase.com.